Uh, we're a 27-year-old uh, company uh, focused in uh, IT, machine learning, geospatial systems, um, and, uh, and process automation. Um, we, uh, I'm leading the machine learning practice in the company. We started, uh, you know, a bit ago. I've, I've got about uh, 15 years of machine learning experience, and uh, we started this effort within the company. And um, this is one of the uh, the prototypes that we've developed. And uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, pleased that, uh, to to be able to share that. You know, what we've been able to do with you today. So if you go to slide two. Hold on, I'm, I'm having a technical issue. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just to describe to you the the technical challenge that we were addressing with this. Uh, you know where the data came from, what the uh, what the actual challenge was. Um, talking about the the data that we were provided. Um, you know how we analyzed that data and developed features for the machine learning solutions. Um, then how we designed that solution. Uh, give you a quick overview of some unsupervised learning techniques. Those are not quite as common as the supervised learning that, that people are probably more familiar with. Uh, then how we implemented it, and then the, the, the results of the, uh, you know, of what we were able to do to detect uh, cyber events within this industrial control system. We go to slide three. Um, this is uh, the diagram on the right just shows you an overview of the uh, water distribution system uh, that this data represents. Um, our our goal is to detect uh, cyber attacks onto the system. Um, so we're going to be provided data that uh, it indicates how the system is operating, and then uh, the system will be attacked uh, by outside. And, and our goal is to detect when those attacks uh, occur. Um, and then through this, we're going to illustrate the machine learning techniques and design processes that we use uh, to solve this challenge. Slide four, please. Uh, so the data source came from a, uh, a group uh, that they, they sponsor these challenges, the Battle of the Attack Detection Algorithms. Um, you can download the data set yourself there if you're uh, if you're interested. Um, but it's based, like I mentioned, on a, a cyber attack on a water distribution system. Uh, they provided us with three data sets. Uh, so the first data set was the system uh, in normal operation. And then they provided a, a, a training data, data set, uh, which contained data uh, of the system that was under attack. And then the final one was what we kind of held aside as a, uh, as a test data set. So we did not do any training on it, but it was when the system was, was also under attack. Um, you go to slide five, I've got a sample of the, of the data that we were provided. Um, so you can see um, the, the data provides information such as the level of the tank, uh, the pump switches, pump flow rates, valve positions, uh, valve flow rates, and then pressures at a, at a wide variety of sensors. Um, each time instance, and I, I, the times were separated by an hour, um, each time instance they gave us 43 uh, you know, uh, features uh, to, to look at. Going on to slide six. Um, so in the, I mentioned that there were two uh, data sets where there were attacks. In the first one, which we're going to call the training data set, uh, there were seven attacks, and they were of, of a variety of different types of attacks that you might see against uh, an industrial control system of this nature. There was a, a replay attack, and then there were some where they were uh, adjusting, uh, you know, altering the, the tank level readings, some where they were reducing pump speeds. Uh, those are the, the, you know, the nature of the attacks that they were conducting on this uh, water distribution system. Uh, the orange line, when it goes up, indicates, you know, each of the attacks, and you'll see this, uh, this type of representation used uh, a little later on. Uh, the second, uh, if you go to slide seven, uh, <clears throat> this is an, another, this is the attacks that were really, uh, that are going to be in our test data set. And so our goal is really to, we're never going to use this test data set in training. Uh, we're only going to use this uh, to test the final uh, the final outcome of our uh, of our solution. Uh, so we'll use this as our primary measure of how effective our machine learning solution is in detecting these uh, these uh, cyber attacks. Uh, if we go on to slide eight, um, so we we began by taking a look you know at all the different data features. Uh, one of the things I'll note is that. Um, they did not provide a change in level of the tank from from uh, data point to data point. We actually uh, created that feature ourselves. 
Uh, that's the, uh, the the DL underscore T1 through T7 that you see at the bottom of the uh, of the chart. Um, we felt like it was that was the, the amount the tank changed over a period is also informa interesting information that we wanted to provide directly to our solution. Um, in here, you can see that the the red features, and particularly the darker the red it is, it means that they're positively correlated. Um, blue features are negatively correlated. Um, you know, and so we see some. You know, you can start to see some interesting features of the data. Some some not not necessarily so interesting, but um, you can see that the the flow in a pump is is non surprisingly directly related to the switch position. They're they're very highly positively correlated, which is what you would expect. Um, uh, but we we saw some other correlations um, in some machine learning. Uh, instances, uh, highly correlated data might not be desired, and you might want to uh, remove some of the data or perform some dimension reduction techniques uh, to reduce the correlated data sets. Um, we felt because of the nature of this problem, which is going to be identifying anomalies in the way a system is performing, that keeping the correlations uh, was probably a good thing. So we did not remove or reduce the correlated data. Um, we, we feel like that the breaking of a correlation might indeed indicate uh, anomalous behavior, and uh, and you might be an important feature for us to to identify an attack. So we did leave those correlated features in. Um, a couple other items to note: uh, pump one is used 100% of the time in the uh, in the normal operation data set. Um, pumps three, five, and nine are never used. Uh, and then uh, one which we'll cover in a little bit in the next slide is pump six and eleven. They are only very rarely used, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this if you go on to slide nine. Um, so, when you have a case where something is only uh, rarely used, you have to be careful because this can show up as an anomaly in your data. Um, also, we uh, since we're going to normalize the data, meaning that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take our data set and we're gonna we're gonna force the data to a zero mean and a one standard deviation. Uh, what happens in a case like this, and you can see in the chart at the bottom of this graph, is you end up with um, with a, um, uh, a a very small standard deviation. So the 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 uh, the thick red lines you can see around uh, you know maybe. 0.02, uh, those are that's the standard deviation. And so, if you normalize this data, uh, you'll end up with a very, very large value uh, because because it is it is only switched on occasionally. Um, this causes some challenges. You you can't just normalize the data and forget about it. You need to you need to take some actions. Uh, one is that you can uh, you can limit how high you'll allow your normalized data to go. Um, we uh, we often use uh, three standard deviations because uh, data beyond that is, uh, is certainly going to be an outlier. Um, the other option you can do is to not normalize uh, this particular uh, feature. Uh, in our case, we did decide to uh, to just limit the uh, the um, uh, the size of that feature to three. Um, so if we go on to slide ten, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the solution architecture. Um, so what we knew going in is that we had a, a data set with no act, uh, attacks that was provided. Um, it's not terribly large. I think it was 8,000 some odd uh, uh, time uh, time slices, which is not very large for a machine learning uh, project. Um, there was also limited data with attacks that was provided. Like I said, we're only going to use the training set of attacks, and I think that was around 4,000 uh, uh, time sequences. And only seven different types of attacks. So uh, one of the things we knew going in is that the amount of data and the the uh, the variation on the attacks is going to be fairly limited, which uh, which can pose a challenge when designing a machine learning solution. Typically, you'd like a lot more data, and you'd like a lot more you know, uh, different uh, types of attacks and how they would affect the system. Um, because we had very little attack information. Uh, we elected not to use a supervised learning technique. Um, we felt like an unsupervised approach was going to be better. Uh, the primary difference between a supervised approach and an unsupervised approach, uh, if we had 
a data set where there was a lot of attack information, uh, we could have trained it to recognize very specifically those attacks. But because we had so few attacks, um, we felt like that wouldn't yield a solution. Instead, we just wanted to characterize the normal system behavior, and then it would detect anomalies in how that system was behaving in a, in a normal environment. Um, we, uh, we investigated two unsupervised approaches. Uh, one was clustering, and the next was a neural network autoencoder. I'll give you a, a brief overview of each of those here in the next two slides. You go to slide, um, oh, actually, the next three slides. So uh, I, I talked a little bit about unsupervised learning approaches. Um, it's, you know, th these type of approaches are used uh, useful when you have unlabeled data sets. And what an unlabeled data set is, is, uh, is a data set where you might not, for example, in ours, we, we're not going to tell it, okay, here's an attack and here is not an attack. If you had a lot of that data, then you could use a supervised approach. We're going to only use the unsupervised uh, data, at least in the first uh, phase of this. Um, like I mentioned, the common approaches are clustering, and we'll, we'll talk about neural network autoencoders, uh, which was the type of um, uh, system that we ended up using. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I'm um, sorry. So we'll talk a little bit about clustering here. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, you, get, you should be on slide 11. Um, so slide 11, uh, you, you're looking at, um, at, at you know, some simple two-dimensional data, and it's been divided into two clusters. So the goal of, of an algorithm would be to look at these data points and determine, okay, here's cluster one, here's cluster two, and then to potentially identify where anomalies or data outliers are, because those are, those are going to indicate something that's occurring in your system that's not normal. Your system is it's an unusual behavior. Um, in our case, we're, we're looking to detect the cyber attacks as those anomalies, but, but they could also occur, you know, if you had equip, equipment malfunctions. Uh, this can also be used to determine, to, to detect equipment malfunctions and whatnot. Um, so if you go to slide 12, uh, I'm going to describe to you quickly what a neural network autoencoder is. Um, this is a, uh, in, in terms of neural networks, uh, it's one of the common mechanisms used to, to do uh, unsupervised learning. Um, because we don't have um, you know, a labeled output, normally in a neural network you would train the network by feeding it an, uh, an input with a matched output, and you would uh, propagate that error back to the network, and, and eventually the network would learn to replicate the, uh, the desired output. But since we don't have that output because it's unsupervised, what we end up doing is we feed the network an input, and we feed it uh, when we're trying to train it to produce that same input as its output, which uh, which seems like it might be a, a, a you know pretty simple task, but what we force it to do is is we force it to go through what you might call like an hourglass shape. So we we force it to reduce the the network down, and in this example, you can see it reduces the network down. You have four inputs, and it reduces it down through two, and then it has to produce four outputs. What's important there is it's it's going to focus on key pieces of information that is that is in your data, um, so that it's able to replicate the output as closely as possible. So it's going to learn it's going to learn how to characterize your data and and uh, and reproduce it on the output. Uh, it'll learn to ignore features that are not terribly important, um, and uh, and 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 combine features together. Uh, and that's what that, that middle layer, which we call the compression layer, is doing. Um, designing this network, so understanding you know, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, neurons are in each of those layers, that's really where the art form comes in in de designing these type of solutions. Um, and figuring out how many uh, neurons are in that, that compression layer is, is, is you know, important in how this system is able to perform. So that it's able to detect anomalies when anomalies occur, and uh, and reject uh, false positives. Uh, next, please. So, um, like I mentioned, we, we selected the neural network autoencoder as the best solution for this particular problem. Um, the uh, we we refined the uh, the architecture. So once we selected that, we then started experimenting with you know how many how many layers are in the network, how many how many neurons are in each, are in each layer, uh, and then most importantly how many neurons are in the compression layer. 
uh, and measuring its performance uh, throughout. Um, if you go to slide 14, um, this is the uh, the final architecture that we came upon. Um, so you'll you'll see on the upper right we we had uh, you know 50 input features like we mentioned earlier on. We then uh, reduced that down through uh, 25 nodes. Then finally in the compression layer we had 18 nodes. Then back out through 25 and finally producing the 50 uh, 50 features. And the goal then is that the output features of this net network are the same as the as what's input. And as long as you can you can recreate that output from the input, then the system will be will be uh, operating normally. You know, those are those are inputs that it's able to understand. Uh, when the when the output no longer matches the input within a sufficient accuracy, that's when you have system performance that that's anom anom anomalous. It's not operating as we had expected uh, it to operate. Um, so we uh, we took we developed uh, you know off of the um, the normal operation data set. So that first data set we looked at, uh, we divided that into a training data set and a test data set, and we trained this network for a thousand uh, epics, uh, which is a complete pass through all the through all the data, uh, and and measured its performance. Uh, if you go to slide 15, um, this is a, this is a typical uh, way to look at uh, neural network accuracy. Um, so here it's trying to model um, you know normal system performance, and you can see it's able to do that uh, quite quickly and, and very effectively. Um, it reduces the uh, the mean squared error of you know of what the output is versus what the input is, uh, you know to to uh, a very low amount, so we were very satisfied with the uh, with the result, uh, the initial result of this. Um, and I do note here that it is we were able to do this actually without a significant uh, hardware investment. We basically I just did this on my on my uh, my business class laptop, and it took less than two minutes to train the network. Um, neural network problems with large data sets that wouldn't be possible, but for this one it was uh, it was something we could approach. Um, so slide 16 show the initial results of the uh, anomaly detection, you know, in this case caused by cybersecurity incidents. Um, if you recall from the earlier slide, um, we, yeah, the orange uh, line represents the attacks. Uh, this is on the, uh, the, the final test data set, so it's never seen this data before. Um, and, it was, and you can see just visually, it looks like it's doing a decent job uh, detecting the uh, you know, cyber attacks. Uh, values where the blue line is high uh, indicate where there's a high error and there's a, an anomaly between the uh, the uh, you know in the input data. Um, a couple of things that we didn't like about this uh, one so the 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 ones uh, like attacks uh, three and four you can see do a very good job they match the orange lines very well so it clearly is identifying the beginning and the end of the attack. That does a very, very good job in, in detecting. And if everything looked like that, we would have been done here at this point. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, but then if you look at the first attack, you can see how it is, uh, it is going up and down quite a bit. It oscillates, and it is clearly at times detecting there's attacks, and then at times it doesn't know that there's an attack going on. Uh, additionally, over at time around 1500, you can see a false positive where it thinks there's an attack going on when in reality there's not. Um, this turns out to actually be a very, very tough problem to solve. It's caused by one of those pumps that rarely comes on, um, and it, it, it's showing up as an anomalous event. Um, so we looked at this and we said, well, we'd, we'd like to improve this result. Um, you know, overall, it's not bad, but we really wanted to do a, a, a better job in saying, okay, there's an attack going on during this time. Um, so we looked at some areas for improvement, including data pre-processing, uh, some additional pre-processing that we could possibly do on the data. But then what we ended up with was adding a, a second uh, supervised neural network as a post-processor uh, for this, this, uh, this data. So if you go to slide 17, um, we, uh, what we did, as you can see to the left, you have the neural network autoencoder. And on the right-hand side, we added a neural network classifier. Uh, so it's, it, took out, it took as its input those 50 outputs 
uh, or the error generated, I'm sorry, it took the error generated each of those outputs as its input, um, and then it's, it was uh, designed to produce a binary output, so a zero indicated normal operation and a one in, uh, indicated anomalous operation. Um, we used the second data set, which included the tax, to, uh, to train this network. Um, so we didn't have a lot of data, uh, and we didn't have, and I think in the end, we didn't have sufficient examples to train it as well as we'd like. But if you go to slide 18, um, you'll see the results of this. And now you can see it's doing a much better job. Uh, in the first attack, it, it, uh, it, it recognizes the attack immediately. It, it stays in an attack state, and then it, re it returns back to a normal state uh, as soon as the attack ends. Um, there's only a couple of instances during an attack where it, uh, it seems to um, you know, not understand that it's under attack. Um, and uh, also that uh, false positive at time 1500 uh, remains. Uh, that turns out to be a really tough challenge because, and that's a, a feature of not having enough training data. Uh, we'd really like to have more data where those pumps that rarely come on um, uh, are, are on so we can, the system can learn that, okay, that is a normal situation. Right now it looks at pretty much any time that pump comes on that it's an unusual situation. Um, so uh, go to slide 19. Um, uh, you know, the uh, conclusion of this is that uh, we were able to, to successfully detect performance anomalies in an industrial control system. These anomalies were brought about by, um, by cybersecurity incidents. Um, this would also work uh, if you had a uh, uh, mechanical failure or electrical failure in the system, it would also detect those type of anomalies. Um, we were very pleased we were able to get these kind of results using a relatively small training data set. Uh, the accuracy was, was very high and, um, and uh, was able to, uh, to reject uh, most of the false positives. Uh, we just had that one remaining. Um, we we're planning to continue this research uh, really want to improve the ability to reject those false positives. Uh, the other thing we want to do is, is be able to identify the specific equipment that's being targeted in an attack. So if you recall from the description of the data set, um, we, we know the, the various components of the system that are being attacked. We'd like the system to be able to, to give us an indication of which of, you know, what, what it thinks the components are that are being affected by the cyber attack. Um, that would also come into play if you were looking for a, you know, a, a, a machinery maintenance piece. If it's a, a machinery failure, you'd really like it to be able to tell you that it's, okay, pump six has, has failed. So uh, that's really where we're looking to go with this next. I think with that, I'm, I'm open to any questions that anyone might have. Great. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, seems like many, everyone, was able to hang in and the, the DCS connection helped for us a bit. Um, so yeah, if there are any other questions, please folks for those who can hear me um, and are able to, to type them up uh, in the window, go ahead and submit them on the, the chat and I'll field them over to, to Scott. Um, right now there's none that have come through Scott. The, the only comments in there are just from um, myself pointing folks to the chat window to enter them and then John Reed from uh, representing HDI and CSI just uh, bringing, bringing some links and providing some links so that the folks who do want to submit a, a technical inquiry through those sites have the source for that. All right, if there's any other questions, please go ahead and submit them. I, I will say I, there, there might be a bit of an issue with um, the way PCS is working right now. I think for some folks, it, they're not able to get, they weren't able to get in after we started it, so I don't know if that's causing any issues with folks. Right yeah, now. I, I, yeah, I, I hope I hit the right level of, uh, of, of technical content. Um, uh, you know, uh, ho hopefully that uh, was able to uh, at least people could understand what we were saying and uh, and, and what what uh, you know the direction we're trying to go. Yeah, and I appreciate that. So um, what we'll do too, in case uh, I didn't already mention this before, we've been recording this the presentation, and so we'll make sure we process this and, and make it available. Uh, we'll be putting it on our Techopedia page so that folks um, can access that. Uh, the same thing with the slides. The question was asked here about when the slides are, would be available. We will put them on our, our Techopedia page for download as well. Um, if anyone wants to get them directly from Scott, they can do so. Um, but we'll be putting them um, to be more 
publicly available, if you will, through uh, our Techopedia page. And we'll provide a link for that in a follow-up email that everyone should be getting within the next few days or so. Um, but then Scott, so question here um, says, are there any planned ideas on dealing with the false positives in future work? Yeah, yes. Now, those are, that's really the, the biggest um, uh, area that we want to research. So you know, we believe that, that one of the key reasons that we have the false positives is because of a lack of, of data. So we think that having more data around those uh, would help. So we've looked at some uh, data augmentation techniques. So essentially increasing the, um, the amount of, of points with those data, data in it. Um, we're also, you know, obviously if we could get, you know, more data where that pump was actually running in, in real circumstances, that would help. Um, if neither of those two works, um, we, we want to look at some other techniques to, uh, to improve that. Uh, we're going to continue experimenting with that, um, with the, the, the layer at the end. Um, to see if we can use it to detect uh, the the uh, the uh, you know a, a false positive. Um, so that is probably the number one thing we're trying to solve right now because um, uh, you know it, it, it's it is a condition that's that's normal. It did have some data to indicate that that was a normal condition. Um, so we 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 are working to 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 see what we can do to resolve that. Good. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the only other question right now is just another interest in the slides, and yes, again, I'll make sure we make those available. Um, they'll be on our Techopedia page, but more importantly, we'll email out a, a link to everybody where they can get those. Um, and then I, I just, I'm sitting on the last slide in the presentation, so for those who can see that, there's an email and phone number there for Scott if you did want to direct any questions to him directly. Um, otherwise, of course, the technical inquiry service is open for anybody to submit them through CS, HD, or CSIX. Um, the question yeah, you know, something else. If, Go ahead. If, if anyone has any feedback uh, for me, if, if um, uh, you know, if, if there was something that could be done to make the presentation better, I'd, I'd also appreciate any feedback. So if you have some comments, I, I'd, uh, you know, feel free to drop me a line. I'd, I'd be interested in, in hearing that so I can improve this for the future. One question for clarification was, uh, what type of auto autoencoder was used? So it was a, a neural network autoencoder. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what other information uh, might be asked for there, um, but but essentially it's a it's a it's a specific architecture of neural networks. The key features being that it it um, it reduces the number of of inputs down through that compression layer, and it is trained by trying to replicate the input on the output. Um, that's kind of the key feature of that neural network autoencoder. If that does not answer the question, you know, please let me know. Yeah, well, the clarification that was just uh, typed in here was uh, variational or sparse, perhaps something else. I'm not familiar with that, so I, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. I suppose the implication there is that autoencoders would be qualified as being either variational or sparse or something of that sort. But yeah. That's... Okay. Well, if there's uh, no other questions, we can kind of go ahead and close this out. Wait, pause for another second or two to see if any come through. Okay, well, Scott, I do. Again, I very much appreciate you taking the time, delivering the presentation. Um, thank you for the content and all that you, you presented. I think it was very well presented. So, uh, if, you know, if I have any other feedback, I'll be sure to let you know. Um, but otherwise, okay. we'll make this available for folks. And, again, if they want to get in contact with you, your, your number and email are all in these slides, so they can get in touch with you that way, and the slides will also be available. So, Scott, thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, everybody, for attending. All right.